I and the entire staff of Truman Medical Center's University Health are beyond honored to have a woman with us today who's made history, who opened doors, and who blazed the trail for so many who work and are patients here at Truman Medical Centers. As a member of the Little Rock Nine, the nine African-American students who desegregated Little Rock Central High School in 1957, she brought international attention to an unjust educational system. Walking through an angry mob and past armed soldiers, only hoping to learn in the same way others did in the city. She was only 15. Imagine having that courage. A teenager like the students with us today from Lincoln College Prep Academy. Though it was slow taking place, integration's pace would have been even slower if it weren't for students, parents, and supporters, people like Ms. Elizabeth Eckford, who stepped out front and pushed. When you think of all those people who have been able to get the education they deserve, who've been able to achieve the American dream, thanks to those steps she took, it's no wonder she has received the nation's highest civilian award, the Congressional Gold Medal. Accompanied by Cresha Williams, I'm so proud today to introduce you to Ms. Elizabeth Ann Eckford. Thank you. Good morning. Please allow me to set the stage. On May 17, 1954, as a result of Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that segregation was unconstitutional. On, seven, on September 3rd, 1957, approximately three years later, federal judge Ronald Davies declared desegregation at Little Rock Central High School. On that very same day, the very same day, Governor Orville Faubus, in defiance of the order, called out the Arkansas National Guard to encircle and prevent the African-American students from entering school on that day. What is unknown to many people is that back then, the NAACP had an ordained or an established plan for the African-American students to enter school. That message, however, was not informed or delivered to Ms. Eckford. As a matter of fact, at that time, she was not affiliated with the NAACP. So on that first day, September 4th, 1957, she entered the school entrance completely alone. Here before us today, we have a living legend. One of the eight, or one of the nine, of the Little Rock Central High School, a living legend. Ms. Eckford, thank you so much for being here today. Will you please share with us what happened that morning? Um, prior to, prior to uh, my junior year of high school, uh, my siblings and I had been paired in going to school. I, uh, the previous year, I had gone to Horace Mann Senior High School, which had been built in anticipation of Little Rock's desegregation plan. They intended limited token desegregation. Um, the superintendent said that he would make the final selection but 85 students signed up indicating their desire to go to Central High School the following fall. Um, this was a much larger group than he anticipated. He um, asked the principals of Dunbar Junior High School and Horace Mann Senior High School to discourage some of the students. Um, he asked them to examine um, 
the students' school records. He didn't want any troublemakers. But what was a troublemaker in the 1950s? Somebody chewed gum, <laughs> talked out of turn in, in class. Maybe one or two people who had a fist fight on the schoolyard. Violence in school was atypical until we went to Central High School, where it was allowed daily. Um, my mother and I read one of the Psalms uh, seeking protection um, before I left home. And uh, I caught the bus in my neighborhood. Um, going to Central was very familiar to me because I had to pass it going to Jun Dunbar Junior High School. I had to pass it going to my grandfather's store. I had to pass through that area going downtown to shop. So um, I got off the bus two blocks from school and I could hear the murmur of a crowd. But I was not afraid because I knew that the Arkansas National Guard was there. Uh, the governor said to preserve peace and good order. I thought that they were there to protect all students. As I approached them, I had seen them break ranks to admit white students. But that day, they didn't admit anybody of color, and that included the janitors and the food service people. So teachers had unique experiences that day. Um, as I approached uh, the corner of 14th and Park, where I had seen them break ranks, they closed ranks when I approached. And so I thought, well, maybe, you know, Central has 26 entrances. The school is two blocks wide. I thought, well, maybe I'm not supposed to enter here. So I walked down further where there was another sidewalk leading to the school. This time, the soldiers crossed rifles to bar me. I still did not understand that they were there to keep me out. So I made a third attempt. And, and when I made a third attempt, the soldier directed me across the street where there were angry demonstrators shouting. As I stepped out into the street, they surged in and were behind me, and immediately in front of me were uh, a lot of photographers, cameramen, and uh, reporters walking backwards. I couldn't go back in the direction I had come, but I knew that there was another bus stop at the end of, of the street, the 16th Street end of the street. So I concentrated on getting to that bus stop, that that is what I saw as safety, getting to another place where I could get away from there. I, my sister and I had walked home from school previously when we went to Dunbar when it was a six-year high school. And um, we, we would walk home sometimes, it was 28 blocks, in order to use our bus fare to buy donuts. So it wasn't the distance that, that kept me from continuing on. It was the fear of the unknown of what might happen to me when there were fewer witnesses around. While I was sitting at the bus stop, several people approached me. Uh, four local reporters stood directly behind me. They intended to be a human barrier so that people could not strike me from behind. On my way there, I had heard people saying, get a rope, let's hang her from a tree. I said a lot of angry, hurtful things. Um, some of it was the kind of language that I expected to hear in school initially. But I thought that once I got in school, people, when they got to know me, that they would accept me. But in truth, to some people, I was never really a human being. Um, the husband of the state president of the NACP approached me. I knew who he was because I had read their weekly newspaper and their photographs were often in the paper. Mother's rule was you don't walk away with strangers. I knew who he was, but I, we didn't know him, so I didn't leave. Terrence Roberts, one of the nine, walked up to me. He had walked to school 
because he lived within five blocks from the school. In total, three of us didn't know about any plan to uh, arrive at the school accompanied by four ministers. Um, Annie Jean Brown, who had been my neighbor once in junior high school, uh, was walking to Central after getting off another bus, and she encountered her minister and joined them. Uh, Terrence walked to school as he would under normal circumstances. He lived within the five blocks of the school. When he approached me and asked me to leave with him, I refused because I knew he lived so close to the school and that I would have a long distance to walk by myself. Um, I, while I was waiting for the bus and it seemed like an interminable wait, I heard a woman uh, talking to the demonstrators. Later newspaper accounts say there were about 250 demonstrators there. And she uh, said that they should be ashamed of what they were doing and that she wanted her little girl to go to school with Negro boys and girls. That outraged them and increased their, their anger. When I was sitting there, there were two middle-aged uh, education reporters from the New York Times and the Washington Post, and they tried to comfort me when one of them reached out and put his arm across my shoulder, the crowd grew more and more angry and started attacking him. Um, Mrs. Lorch, the woman, white woman who had confronted the, the group, came and sat beside me. I was impatient and I got up to walk across the street to a drugstore where I wanted to call a cab but they locked the door before we could get there. So I had to go back and wait and wait and wait. Finally, the bus did come and Mrs. Lorch um, got on the bus with me and two teenage boys tried to get on the bus and she kicked them back. The driver slammed the door and drove away quickly. I was able to reassure Mrs. Lorch within four blocks that I needed to go to my mother that I would be safe and uh, that I didn't need any more of her help. So she got off the bus. My mother worked for the Arkansas School for the Negro, Deaf, and Blind, where my brother went to school. My mother was there primarily to look after the welfare of my brother. See, my brother was mute. He was voluntarily mute. I remember when he was younger and he would have monosyllabic speech, he could say pie or cake that he wanted, but that's about all he said. Uh, in fact, uh, recently in a, in a nursing home where he lives, um, the people there, a lot, many of the people there had never heard him speak. He saw them drawing blood from some of the patients and he said, you need to leave Oscar alone. Um, when I walked into the building, they told me my mother was downstairs in the basement in the laundry room where she worked. When I walked in, her, her, she had her back to me. But when you know someone really, really well, you can sometimes read their body language. And I knew that she had been praying. When she turned around, I could see that she had been crying. We embraced and we talked for a while, but... I don't remember anything that we talked about. And afterwards, I walked home. Uh, our house was five blocks away from the school. And when I um, got to my yard, one of the neighbors said that my father was driving around looking for me. Um, news reports over the radio were very irresponsible back in those days. And so my father thought that I had been physically harmed he didn't know till he saw me that uh, I didn't have any scars. And of all the things that happened in the school, none of us have any broken bones or, um, or any physical scars, but we've all been deeply wounded, all of us. So much so that for 30 years, none of us talked about what it was like inside school. So most people thought that 
the worst that happened happened uh, in front of cameras. That's not so. When we were turned away from the school, my father took me to meet the president of NACP because we knew that we would need legal help in order to get into school. There were more than 17 days of uncertainty as to when we would get in school and where we would go to school. In the, in the interim, one of the, one of those students who, actually there were 10 who had intended to go to Central, she dropped out because her father had received so much pressure he was going to lose his job. My parents both worked two jobs to take care of six kids, pay the mortgage, and pay the car debt. So employment, what, what employment was available to my people was extremely important. Ms. Uh, Eckford, when were you guys actually able to enter the school? We got in school secretly on September 23rd. By that time, the segregationists were concentrated at, at the service station at 16th and Park. We went into a side door at 14th and Park. So it took about an hour and a half before many students in the school and the demonstrators outside learned that we were there. The governor had removed the National Guard. A court had ordered him to um, stop interfering in our going to school, he could have left the, the all-white National Guard there to uh, protect the students in the community. Instead, he withdrew them. And so local police who had not had training in crowd control set up barricades and tried to, tried to maintain order. As I said, on the first day, there were 250 demonstrators. On September 22nd, there were 1,000 people. They became a mob when they found out we were in school. The chief of police promised them that he would give them one of us. He was buying time. We were gathered with the police in school on the ground floor. I thought it was a basement. It actually was the first floor of the school. And um, the, they had cars in the building unmarked cars, and policemen in civilian clothes. He, he told us to stay down in the cars, and he told the policemen to drive fast and not stop anything. So I say to you sincerely that Little Rock police saved our lives that day. Meanwhile, out in front of the school, um, the crowd had gone berserk. They were about to overrun the barricades. They started attacking reporters. There were three Negro reporters. Two of them ran, but one, Alec Wilson, the, the editor of the Memphis Tri-State Defender, a weekly newspaper, refused to run. He said he was a Marine. He had fought for this country. He had run before, but he was not going to run again. So there's a series of pictures that people saw an ugly reality of America during a time of Cold War where American propaganda was trying to combat Soviet propaganda. President Eisenhower had been talking to the governor, trying to convince him to stop interfering. But when people saw the mob attacking this re reporter, there's a series of pictures where you see Alec Wilson being choked, kicked, knocked down repeatedly. And all the time, he's holding on to his hat. His friends later uh, joked with him, why was he holding on to his hat? He said that it was the only shred of dignity he had. The police arrested some white photographers and two people who had attacked Alex Wilson. To this day, nobody's ever been prosecuted. Ms. Eckford, you shared um, 
in a conversation that I was privileged to have with you on yesterday, a group of us, you shared about that photograph, or that photograph, the infamous yes. photograph. Yes, uh, our experience is an example of unintended consequences. I was a very shy, submissive child. My parents were the last to give consent in October after the names of some of the students were published in the newspaper. Uh, my mother, I called the queen of no. When the superintendent said that those students selected could not participate in extracurricular activities, this wasn't a barrier to me. This made the numbers go smaller. But it wasn't, a, wasn't uh, something that would keep me from wanting to go because my mother would not have let us participate in extracurricular activities and be uh, in school at night or late in the evening. My mother uh, was the only protection for six children. My father, in his primary job, worked very late at night at the train station. Um, the only protection we had afterwards was neighbors who would get up late at night and check around our house. There were a lot of wooded lots on my block and in the block and then uh, other blocks around me. And my mother had a reputation of firing off old Toby late at night if she heard something. I don't, she would crack the kitchen door. I don't know if she was firing up or firing into the ground. But um, Mr. Bullock and, and uh, Mr. Jones were really uh, taking a chance in trying to protect us. We didn't have police protection. My sister remembers that for three nights there were FBI men in the woods around us. But other than that, we didn't have any protection. But we lived on a, a block that dead ended right next to an all white development. See, I lived in an old part of Little Rock where houses had been individually built and throughout most of the city, there were no barriers between ethnic groups. You didn't have to cross a pond or go down in the holla or cross the railroad tracks to uh, approach a Negro neighborhood or a white neighborhood. That was true in most of Little Rock. But the other new high school that had been built had been built in the upper income section of Little Rock so that the children of the local gentry would not have to endure desegregation. And this was one of the reasons that there was such an uproar because they felt like desegregation was being imposed on people who didn't have a lot of money. Ms. Eckberg, can you share with us the, um, you, the, Photograph when the young man was taking the picture, and you yes. said that how mm -hmm. he had a special. He he had. Uh, this, remember, this is 1957. People from the big publications use what were called speed graphic cameras. These big clunky things with slow film. They used them because they made good negatives. But they uh, there might have been as many as 20 to 25 cameramen and photographers there, but there were only two who got the mob scene picture. One was a stringer for United Press, and the other one was a local uh, news photographer who was new on the staff, and his photo chief had stationed him where they didn't expect anything to happen. But the photos that he took of Alec Wilson being pummeled and of the mob scene. He said that in the mob scene photograph, it's really a picture of Hazel Bryan, a girl who had a fist, her face twisted in hatred, rather than a photograph of me. But um, one thing I've learned is that photographs can be manipulated to tell a, a different story from what happened. But that photograph, has persisted in uh, near the end of the 20th century, Associated Press said that it was one of the most significant photographs of the century. 
and this was taken by a doobie. This photograph made uh, was one of two of his that were contenders for the Pulitzer Prize. The morning newspaper was given a Pulitzer, and they were reluctant to give more than one Pulitzer for, for the same story. But that, that, uh, that photograph um, created his career. When I met him in 1997, he had been retired as a professor of photojournalism at Indiana University at Bloomington. So, and his, uh, he was there in Little Rock because he had been assigned there by his daughter, who was the photo chief of Newsweek magazine. So he was revisiting a, a story that had been pivotal to his career. Um, Ms. Eckford, the mm -hmm. um, conversation that you and I had over the phone a couple days ago, um, you pointed out that you were not a part of integration, but rather desegregation. Yes. Can you, um, in our, I, I call our experience desegregation. The district intended limited token desegregation. They felt like if they had a few black faces, they could call that desegregation. They would intend for it to impact uh, the children of the local gentry at all, the, the, the power movers of Little Rock. But one thing that our experience demonstrates is what happens when people are silent. The only public voices that you heard or that were on the news or in the newspaper were the lawyers and the preachers who were leading the White Citizens Council. And the White Citizens Council was popular because it did not have the violent reputation of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, yes, thank you for mm -hmm. sharing. I do have a, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned that you kind of described yourself as someone who was once shy mm -hmm. and quiet spoken. Mm -hmm. um, when we see, when I see the pictures, especially the the mob scene with the um, the lady in the back yelling at mm -hmm. you, um, I don't see shy at all. I see strength. I had sunglasses on because I have uh, uh, a sensitivity to bright light, and um, of course, it's, schools opened in September, and it was blazingly hot. Um, I kept walking because. Getting to that bus stop meant safety to me. I didn't talk to the reporters in front of me who were asking questions. I heard everything the people around me were saying, and I was very frightened. Uh, growing up, my mother had discouraged us from fighting even among ourselves. Of course, we had sibling rivalries. That's something she couldn't control. Uh, but my, my older sister was, was placed in charge of us. She is 80 years old and thinks she's in charge now. <laughs> uh, some, some habits are lifelong. Um, but I, I was very shy. Uh, one writer in reaching out to people who had known me as a child asked what I was like and one, one former classmate said I would raise my hand, but I would look shocked when I was called upon. Uh, I, I'm not shy now because of constant exposure to the press and because I started thinking about what shyness meant. It really is an intense focus on yourself. A shy person thinks people are looking at them when they're not listening to them when they are not. Uh, they think that what they do is, is important. <laughs> I'm, what you see now is a, partly a self-made person. I changed my speech because I got tired of reporters asking me to repeat what I said. See, I wanted the reporters to, I, I wanted to answer them and for them to leave as soon as possible. 
That's why I changed my speech and substituted some hard sounds. Um, it turns out that I like speaking to groups. Um, my, my favorite audience is high school juniors because I feel like uh, with young minds I could have more of an, an impression. But I appreciate all of you for your interest in something that happened so long ago. We appreciate you. Miss mm -hmm. <laughs> Eckford, would you still be open to um, allowing the audience to answer or to ask some questions? Yes. Uh -huh. Before we get to that point, um, if you could leave the young the youngsters here, the I'm, I'm, I'm with them, I'm the youngsters. Mm -hmm. But if you could leave any words of wisdom, any nuggets of truth with all of us in that room, in the room today, what would it be? Well, um, I haven't talked about what it was like inside school. When we first went into school, the principal told us to not bother our teachers to report incidences to the vice principals. But he said he wouldn't respond to anything we said it was not witnessed by a teacher. Back in those days, teachers were not standing in the doorway or looking down the hallways to see what was happening. Some teachers didn't even seem to know what was happening in their own classrooms. Terrence Roberts wrote that the, at the end of one day in his English class, he took a dozen can openers to his teacher. Back in those days, the can openers had a a sharp pointed tip to them. She said, why did you bring these to school? He said, these were thrown at me in this class. There were a lot of people who were not seeing, and not hearing what was going on. Majority of people, of students, when they saw us being body slammed into wall lockers when I saw people tr knocking us down on the concrete and metal stairs. Just kept on going. Didn't respond to what they saw or heard. True, it's a very, very large school. Inside the school, the hallways bend left and right, so you can't look, you can't stand in the center and see the end of the hallway. So you can't see everything that is happening. But for the people immediately around, I saw them turning away. You see, there were about 200 students who were organized to attack us every day. And this happened every day from beginning to end. Each of us was assigned a soldier guard who followed us several paces behind in the hallway. Every president is the command in chief of all armed forces. So um, as in response to what was happening in Little Rock, President Eisenhower on ordered 1,000 paratroopers from Fort Campbell, Kentucky to Little Rock. And he took federal control of the Arkansas National Guard. The first thing the soldiers did was to affix bayonets to their rifles. There were helicopters hovering over the school grounds. On television, you could see soldiers walking the roof of the building. And in the, in the center, the building is more than three stories tall. It's a flat roof. Uh, uh, I, I'm reminded of, uh, I met someone who was from the first class, 1927, and he asked, does the roof still leak? It, well, it still did, and it's doing it now. But, but the district didn't have the, the money for that kind of repair. So they painted, repainted the walls and the paint didn't stick. But, uh, but I digress. Uh, I said I wanted to talk directly to the students. Not only was there an absence of responsible voices among the adults. But there was an absence of voices from the students. 
Remember I said I was very shy. My speech class was the last class of the day. That was a class I looked forward to every day because from the beginning to the end, there were two students who reached out to me in kindness and talked to me as though I were any other person. If you can support someone who's being bullied, you can actually help someone. This is not an exaggeration. This comes from somebody who has a lifelong history of serious depression. If you support someone who you see is being hurt, you can help someone live another day. Is that powerful? Language is powerful, whether you are silent or not. If you are silent, Somebody else is speaking for you. So use your voices in support of someone you know is being hurt. I never ask anybody to try to defend them. That can be dangerous. But anybody can use the golden rule, any of you, even young people. I'm so glad you're here. You're my favorite audience. Because I, I think this is where I can teach again. Uh, I was a history major, and uh, I was a long-term substitute teacher. I had seventh, eighth, and ninth grade students, and they were so dear to me. Um, I've met some of them as adults. Some of them are retired now. <laughs> it's been so long. Do we have any questions from the students or from the audience? Come on now. If you don't ask questions, it makes me feel like I haven't done anything right. <laughs> um, to begin, thank you for your contribution to education. Because of you, I can get the best possible education. So I want to thank you like from the bottom of my heart. And also, I was just wondering, did you ever think that you would have this big of an effect on people and how did you like fathom it? There was no way I could anticipate uh, um, the importance of what was happening. But uh, as a former political science student, I have to remind you that the real importance of what happened in Little Rock was the resolution of a constitutional conflict between state and federal government. I saw a hand over here somewhere. Mr. Actor, um, I just want to tell you, for as a, at the time, I was a student in elementary school when you all were going through what you went through, and it made so much difference here in Kansas City. I saw my parents, I saw my mom, you know, tears in her eyes. This got me so interested in finding out and becoming an educator and finding out. I mean, you were my hero. I actually told my daughter that this morning. But I just want to say that I thank God for you because of you. My class at an elementary school, we got closer. And it was a little bit integrated. I think the only black family was my family at the time, and there were four, there are still 14 of us, but I'm just saying you made a difference. It made us want to see what's going on. And if it was not for people like you, we would not, none of us, I don't believe, would enjoy things the way they are. And I just want to thank God for you. And I know this is out of the ordinary, but I want to give you one of our, our chief baseball, uh, our chief football uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you have any questions, would it be easier? Uh, I'm going to the rear because these people have been standing <laughs> and see if there are any questions back here. Thank you for being present. Um, I, I was raised in the great state of Arkansas in Hazen, rural Arkansas, and we were bust. And because of that experience of being bused, our parents moved us from Arkansas to Oklahoma. Let me pick up on that. 
Uh, Central High was not the first school in Arkansas to, be, to voluntarily desegregate, but it was uh, a first major test of the Brown decision. Prior to that time, four schools in Arkansas, in very, very small towns, voluntarily desegregated, and it was for economic reasons. These school districts did not have secondary schools for their Negro students, so they had to transport them to a larger town. In some cases, they had to pay for their boarding in larger towns. It was an economic drain on the school district. Not a question, but uh, more first I would like to say um, just your vivid and visceral recollection of the events speaks to how much it meant to you. Um, being at 60 years removed and the fact that you can recall that uh, it's not only impressive, but it shows, I think, the conviction of what it meant to you at the time that it's imprinted on your brain uh, for that long. Uh, but with that, I was also able to um, ironically go to Topeka just last week uh, for some training for my job. And with that, I made it a point to go to the Brown B Board of Education building and walk through and read and see that history um, as it's, it's played a part um, in my life. Um, your acts, along with them and others, um, obviously in America, trying to close the gap of brown and white. Um, my life is the consummation of that. Um, I have mixed ethnicity. I'm black, white, and Polynesian. My parents were able to conceive me. I was adopted by a white family. I was able to go to good schooling. I finished my bachelor's, and I'm a few months removed from getting my master's. Speaking directly to what you've done, it's opened those doors, and I'm able to do that. And I appreciate you. I'm really, really glad that I was able to talk to a cop. <laughs> I, I, for 10 years, I was a probation officer for adult felons, some teenagers too, because you know, sometimes teenagers are prosecuted as adults. Um, so I, 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 my office was in the courthouse, so I was surrounded by policemen all the time. Sometimes we needed you. Remember that uh, policemen, policemen and firemen are first responders. First responders walk toward danger. So we appreciate them very much. I know I probably have gone over time, uh, but I, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for your patience and your interest. Thank you. Ms. Eckford, thank you so much for being here. We truly appreciate you. Um, and we don't take it for granted to have a li living legend here. Um, we honor you on today, and we just thank you. Can we all stand and give an, um, jazz hands to Ms. Eckford? Thank you so much.